Chapter One of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume Two. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume Two, Paris and Prison, by Giacomo Casanova, translated by Arthur Machen. Episode Six, Chapter One. Leave Bologna a happy man. The captain parts from us in Reggio, where I spend a delightful night with Henriette. Our arrival in Parma. Henriette resumes the costume of a woman. Our mutual felicity. I meet some relatives of mine, but do not discover myself. The reader can easily guess that there was a change as sudden as a transformation in a pantomime, and that the short but magic sentence, Come to Parma, proved a very fortunate catastrophe, thanks to which I rapidly changed, passing from the tragic to the gentle mood, from the serious to the tender tone. Sooth to say, I fell at her feet, and lovingly pressing her knees, I kissed them repeatedly with raptures of gratitude. No more fiore, no more bitter words. They do not suit the sweetest of all human feelings. Loving, docile, grateful, I swear never to beg for any favor, not even to kiss her hand, until I have shown myself worthy of her precious love. The heavenly creature, delighted to see me pass so rapidly from despair to the most lively tenderness, tells me with a voice the tone of which breathes of love, to get up from my knees. I am sure that you love me, says she, and be quite certain that I shall leave nothing undone to secure the constancy of your feelings. Even if she had said that she loved me as much as I adored her, she would not have been more eloquent, for her words expressed all that could be felt. My lips were pressed to her beautiful hands as the captain entered the room. He complimented us with perfect good faith, and I told him, my face beaming with happiness, that I was going to order the carriage. I left them together, and in a short time we were on the road, cheerful, pleased, and merry. Before reaching Reggio, the honest captain told me that, in his opinion, it would be better for him to proceed to Parma alone, as, if we entered in that city altogether, it might cause some remarks, and people would talk about us much less if we were without him. We both thought him quite right, and we immediately made up our minds to pass the night in Reggio, while the captain would take a post-chase and go alone to Parma. According to that arrangement, his trunk was transferred to the vehicle which he hired in Reggio. He bade us farewell and went away, after having promised to dine with us on the following day in Parma. The decision taken by the worthy Hungarian was, doubtless, as agreeable to my lovely friend as to me, for our delicacy would have condemned us to a great reserve in his presence. And truly, under the new circumstances, how were we to arrange for our lodgings in Reggio? Henriette could not, of course, share the bed of the captain any more, and she could not have slept with me as long as he was with us, without being guilty of great immodesty. We should all three have laughed at that compulsory reserve, which we would have felt to be ridiculous, but we should, for all that, have submitted to it. Love is the little impudent god, the enemy of bashfulness, and although he may very often enjoy darkness and mystery, but if he gives way to it, he feels disgraced. He loses three-fourths of his dignity, and the greatest portion of his charms. Evidently there could be no happiness for Henriette, or for me, unless we parted with the person, and even with the remembrance of the excellent captain. We supped alone. I was intoxicated with a felicity which seemed too immense, and yet I felt melancholy. But Henriette, who looked sad likewise, had no reproach to address to me. Our sadness was in reality nothing but shyness. We loved each other, but we had no time to become acquainted. We exchanged only a few words. There was nothing witty, nothing interesting in our conversation, which struck us both as insipid, and we found more pleasure in the thoughts which filled our minds. We knew that we were going to pass the night together, but we could not have spoken of it openly. What a night! What a delightful creature was that Henriette, whom I have loved so deeply, who has made me so supremely happy. It was only three or four days later that I ventured on asking her what she would have done, 
without a groat in her possession, having not one acquaintance in Parma, if I had been afraid to declare my love, and if I had gone to Naples. She answered that she would doubtless have found herself in very great difficulties, but that she had all along felt certain of my love, and that she had foreseen what had happened. She added that, being impatient to know what I thought of her, she had asked me to translate to the captain what she had expressed respecting her resolution, knowing that he could neither oppose that resolution, nor continue to live with her, and that, as she had taken care not to include me in the prayer which she addressed to him through me, she had thought it impossible that I should fail to ask whether I could be of some service to her, waiting to take a decision until she could have ascertained the nature of my feelings towards her. She concluded by telling me that if she had fallen, it was the fault of her husband and of her father-in-law, both of whom she characterized as monsters rather than men. When we reached Parma, I gave the police the name of Ferrusi, the same that I had assumed in Cessna. It was the family name of my mother, while Henrietta wrote down Anne d'Arqui de France. While we were answering the questions of the officer, a young Frenchman, smart and intelligent looking, offered me his services, advising me not to put up at the posting inn, but to take lodgings at d'Andre Morit Hotel, where I should find good apartments, French cooking, and the best French wines. Seeing that Henriette was pleased with the proposal, I told the young man to take us there, and we were soon very comfortably lodged. I engaged the Frenchman by the day, and carefully settled all my arrangements with d'Andremont. After that I attended to the housing of my carriage. Coming in again for a few moments, I told Henriette that I would return in time for dinner, and ordering the servant to remain in the anteroom, I went out alone. Parma was then groaning under a new government. I had every reason to suppose that there were spies everywhere, and under every form. I therefore did not want to have at my heels a valet who might have injured rather than served me. Though I was in my father's native city, I had no acquaintances there, but I knew that I should soon find my way. When I found myself in the streets, I could scarcely believe that I was in Italy, for everything had a Tramontine appearance. I heard nothing but French and Spanish and those who do not speak one of those languages seem to be whispering to one another. I was going about at random, looking for a hosier, yet unwilling to inquire where I could find one. At last I saw what I wanted. I entered the shop, and addressing myself to a stout, good-looking woman, seated behind the counter, I said, Madam, I wish to make some purchases. Sir, shall I send for someone speaking French? You need not do so. I am an Italian. God be praised! Italians are scarce in these days. Why scarce? Do you not know that Don Philip has arrived, and that his wife, Madame de France, is on the road? I congratulate you, for it must make trade very good. I suppose that money is plentiful, and that there is abundance for all commodities. That is true, but everything is high in price, and we cannot get reconciled to these new fashions. There is a bad mixture of French freedom and Spanish haughtiness which addles our brains. But, sir, what sort of linen do you require? In the first place, I must tell you that I never tried to drive a hard bargain. Therefore, be careful. If you charge me too much, I shall not come again. I want some fine linen for twenty-four chemises, some dimity for stays and petticoats, some muslin, some cambric for pocket handkerchiefs, and many other articles which I should be very glad to find in your shop, for I am a stranger here, and God knows in what hands I am going to entrust myself. You will be an honest ones if you will give me your confidence. I am sure that you deserve it, and I abandon my interests to you. I want likewise to find some needlewomen, willing to work in the lady's room, because she requires everything to be made very rapidly. And dresses? Yes, dresses, caps, mantles, in fact, everything, for she is naked. With money she shall soon have all she wants. Is she young? She is four years younger than I. She is my wife. Ah, may God bless you. Any children? Not yet, my good lady, but they will come, for we do all that is necessary to have them. I have no doubt of it. How pleased I am. Well, sir, I shall send for the very phoenix of all dressmakers. In the meantime, choose what you require. It will amuse you. 
I took the best of everything, and paid, and the dressmaker, making her appearance at that moment, I gave my address, requesting that various sorts of stuff might be sent at once. I told the dressmaker and her daughter, who had come with her, to follow me and to carry the linen. On my way to the hotel, I brought several pairs of silk stockings, and took with me a bootmaker who lived close by. Oh, what a delightful moment! Henriette, who had not the slightest idea of what I had gone out for, looked at everything with great pleasure, yet without any of those demonstrations which announce a selfish or interested disposition. She showed her gratitude only by the delicate praise which she bestowed upon my taste and upon the quality of the articles I had purchased. She was not more cheerful on the account of my presence, but the tender affection with which she looked at me was the best proof of her grateful feelings. The valet I had hired had entered the room with the shoemaker. Henriette told him quietly to withdraw, and not to come unless he was called. The dressmaker set to work. The shoemaker took her measure, and I told him to bring her some slippers. He returned in a short time, and the valet came in again with him without having been called. The shoemaker, who spoke French, was talking the usual nonsense of dealers, when she interrupted him to ask the valet, who was standing familiarly in the room, what he wanted. "'Nothing, madam. I am only awaiting for your orders.' "'Have I not told you that you would be called when your services were required? "'I should like to know who is my master, you or the gentleman.' "'Neither,' I replied, laughing. "'Here are your day's wages. Be off at once.' The shoemaker, seeing that Henriette spoke only French, begged to recommend a teacher of languages. "'What country does he belong to?' she inquired. "'To Flanders, madam,' answered Crispin. "'He is a very learned man, about fifty years old. He is said to be a good man. He charges three libres for each lesson of one hour, and six for two hours, but he requires to be paid each time. "'My dear,' said Henriette to me, "'do you wish me to engage that master?' "'Yes, dearest, it will amuse you.' The shoemaker promised to send the Flemish professor the next morning. The dressmakers were hard at work, the mother cutting, the daughter sewing. But as progress could not be too rapid, I told the mother that she would oblige us if she could procure another seamstress who spoke French. "'You shall have one this very day, sir,' she answered, and she offered me the services of her own son as a servant, saying that if I took him... I should be certain to have neither a thief nor a spy about me, and that he spoke French pretty well. Henriette thought we could not do better than to take the young man. Of course, this was enough to make me consent at once, for the slightest wish of the women we love is our supreme law. The mother went for him, and she brought back at the same time the half-French dressmaker. It all amused my goddess, who looked very happy. The young man was about eighteen, pleasant, gentle, and modest. I inquired his name. He answered that it was Caldagna. The reader may very likely recollect that my father's native place had been Parma, and that one of his sisters had married a Caldagna. It would be a curious coincidence, I thought, if that dressmaker should be my aunt, and my valet my cousin. But I did not say it aloud. Henriette asked me if I had any objection to the first dressmaker dining at our table. I entreat you, my darling, I answered, never for the future to ask my consent in such trifling matters. Be quite certain, my beloved, that I shall always approve everything you may do. She smiled and thanked me. I took out my purse and said to her, Take these fifty sequins, dearest, to pay for your small expenses, and to buy the many trifles which I should be sure to forget. She took the money, assuring me that she was vastly obliged to me. A short time before dinner the worthy captain made his appearance. Henriette ran to meet him and kissed him, calling him her dear father, and I followed her example by calling him my friend. My beloved little wife invited him to dine with us every day. The excellent fellow, seeing all the women busily working for Henriette, was highly surprised at having procured such a good position for his young adventuress, and I crowned his happiness by telling him that I was indebted to him for my felicity. Our dinner was delicious, and it proved a cheerful meal. I found out that Henriette was dainty, and my old friend a lover of good wines. I was both, and I felt that I was a match for them. We tasted several excellent wines which d'Andremont had recommended, 
and altogether we had a very good dinner. The young valet pleased me in consequence of the respectful manner in which he served everyone, his mother as well as his masters. His sister and the other seamstress had dined apart. We were enjoying our dessert when the hosier was announced, accompanied by another woman and a milliner who could speak French. The other woman had brought patterns of all sorts of dresses. I let Henriette order caps, headdresses, etc., as she pleased, but I would interfere in the dress department, although I complied with the excellent taste of my charming friend. I made her choose four dresses, and I was indeed grateful for her ready acceptance of them, for my own happiness was increased in proportion to the pleasure I gave her, and the influence I was obtaining over her heart. Thus did we spend the first day, and we certainly could not have accomplished more. In the evening, as we were alone at supper, I fancied that her lovely face looked sad. I told her so. My darling, she answered with a voice that went to my heart, you are spending a great deal of money on me, and if you do so in the hope of my loving you more dearly, I must tell you it is money lost, for I do not love you now more than I did yesterday, but I do love you with my whole heart. All you may do that is not strictly necessary pleases me, only because I see more and more how worthy you are of me, but it is not needed to make me feel all the deep love which you deserve. I believe you, dearest, and my happiness is indeed great, if you feel that your love for me cannot be increased. But learn also, delight of my heart, that I have done it all only to try to love you even more than I do, if possible. I wish to see you beautiful and brilliant in the attire of your sex, and if there is one drop of bitterness in the fragrant cup of my felicity, it is a regret in not being able to surround you with the halo which you deserve. Can I be otherwise than delighted, my love, if you are pleased? You cannot, for one moment, doubt my being pleased, and as you have called me your wife, you are right in one way. But if you are not very rich, I leave it to you to judge how deeply I ought to reproach myself. Ah, my beloved angel, let me, I beg of you, believe myself wealthy, and be quite certain that you cannot possibly be the cause of my ruin. You were born only for my happiness. All I wish is that you may never leave me. Tell me whether I can entertain such a hope. I wish it myself, dearest, but who can be sure of the future? Are you free? Are you dependent on anyone? I am free in the broadest meaning of that word. I am dependent on no one but you, and I'd love to be so. I congratulate you, and I am very glad of it, for no one could tear me from your arms. But alas, you know that I cannot say the same as you. I am certain that some persons are, even now, seeking for me, and they will not find it difficult to secure me if they ever discover where I am. Alas, I feel how miserable I should be if they ever succeeded in dragging me away from you. You make me tremble. Are you afraid of such dreadful misfortune here? No, unless I should happen to be seen by someone knowing me. Are any such persons likely to be here at present? I think not. Then do not let our love take alarm. I trust your fears will never be verified. Only, my darling one, you must be as cheerful as you were in Cessna. I shall be more truly so now, dear friend. In Cessna I was miserable, while now I am happy. Do not be afraid of my being sad, for I am of a naturally cheerful disposition." I suppose that in Cessna you were afraid of being caught by the officer whom you had left in Rome. Not at all. That officer was my father-in-law, and I am quite certain that he never tried to ascertain where I had gone. He was only too glad to get rid of me. I felt unhappy because I could not bear to be a charge on a man whom I could not love, and with whom I could not even exchange one thought. Recollect also that I could not find consolation in the idea that I was ministering to his happiness for I had only inspired him with a passing fancy, which he had himself valued at ten sequins. I could not help feeling that his fancy, once gratified, was not likely, at his time of life, to become a more lasting sentiment, and I could therefore only be a burden to him, for he was not wealthy. Besides, there was a miserable consideration which increased my secret sorrow. I thought myself bound in duty to caress him, and on his side, as he thought that he ought to pay me in the same money. I was afraid of his ruining his health for me, 
and that idea made me very unhappy. Having no love for each other, we allowed a foolish feeling of regard to make both of us uncomfortable. We lavished, for the sake of a well-meaning but false decorum, that which belongs to love alone. Another thing troubled me greatly. I was afraid lest people might suppose that I was a source of profit to him. That idea made me feel the deepest shame. Yet, whenever I thought of it, I could not help admitting that such a supposition, however false, could not be wanting in probability. It is owing to that feeling that you found me so reserved towards you, for I was afraid that you might harbor that fearful idea if I allowed you to read in my looks the favorable impression which you had made in my heart. Then it was not owing to a feeling of self-love? No, I confess it, for you could but judge me as I deserved. I had been guilty of the folly, now known to you, because my father-in-law intended to bury me in a convent, and that did not suit my taste. But, dearest friend, you must forgive me if I cannot confide even to you the history of my life. I respect your secret, darling. You need not fear any intrusion from me on that subject. All we have now to do is to love one another, and not allow any dread of the future to mar our actual felicity. The next day, after a night of intense enjoyment, I found myself more deeply in love than before, and the next three months were spent by us in an intoxication of delight. At nine o'clock the next morning, the teacher of Italian was announced. I saw a man of respectable appearance, polite, modest, speaking very little but very well, reserved in his answers and with the manners of olden times. We conversed, and I could not help laughing when he said, with an air of perfect good faith, that a Christian could only admit the system of Copernicus as a clever hypothesis. I answered that it was the system of God himself, because it was that of nature, and that it was not in the Holy Scripture that the laws of science could be learned. The teacher smiled in a manner which betrayed the tartuffe, and if I had consulted only my own feelings, I should have dismissed the poor man. But I thought that he might amuse Henriette and teach her Italian. After all, it was what I wanted from him. My dear wife told him that she would give him six libri for a lesson of two hours, the libra of Parma being worth only about three pence. His lessons were not very expensive. She took her first lesson immediately, and gave him two sequins, asking him to purchase her some good novels. Whilst my dear Henriette was taking her lesson, I had some conversation with the dressmaker, in order to ascertain whether she was a relative of mine. "'What does your husband do?' I asked her. "'He is the steward to the Marquis of Sisa. "'Is your father still alive?' "'No, sir, he is dead.' "'What was his family's name?' Scotty. "'Are your husband's parents still alive?' "'His father is dead, but his mother is still alive, "'and resides with her uncle, Canon Casanova.' "'That was enough. "'The good woman was my Welsh cousin, "'and her children were my Welsh nephews.' My niece, Jeniton, was not pretty, but she appeared to be a good girl. I continued my conversation with the mother, but I changed the topic. Are the Parmesians satisfied with being the subjects of a Spanish prince? Satisfied? Well, in that case we should be easily pleased, for now we are in a regular maze. Everything is upset. We do not know where we are. Oh, happy times of the house of Farnese! Whither have you departed? The day before yesterday I went to the theatre, and Harlequin made everybody roar with laughter. Well, now, fancy, Don Filippo, our new duke, did all he could to remain serious, and when he could not manage it, he would hide his face in his hat, so that people should not see that he was laughing, for it is said that laughter ought never to disturb the grave and stiff countenance of an infante of Spain and that he would be dishonored in Madrid if he did not conceal his mirth. What do you think of that? Can such manners suit us? Here we laugh willingly and heartily. Oh, the good Duke Antonio, God rest his soul, was certainly as great as a prince as Duke Filippo, but he did not hide himself from his subjects when he was pleased, and he would sometimes laugh so heartily that he could be heard in the streets. Now we are all in the most fearful confusion." For the last three months, no one in Parma knows what's o'clock. Have, have all the clocks been destroyed? 
No, but ever since God created the world, the sun has always gone down at half-past five, and at six the bells have always tolled for the Angelus. All respectable people knew that at that time the candle had to be lit. Now it is very strange the sun has gone mad, for he sets every day at a different hour. Our peasants do not know when they are to come to market. All that is called a regulation, but you, do you know why? Because now everybody knows that dinner is to be eaten at twelve o'clock. A fine regulation indeed. Under the Farnese we used to eat when we were hungry, and that was much better. That way of reasoning was certainly singular, but I did not think it sounded foolish in the mouth of a woman of humble rank. It seems to me that a government ought never to destroy ancient customs abruptly, and that innocent errors ought to be corrected only by degrees. Henrietta had no watch. I felt delighted at the idea of offering her such a present, and I went out to purchase one. But after I had bought a very fine watch, I thought of earrings, of a fan, and of many other pretty knick-knacks. Of course I bought them all at once. She received all those gifts, offered by love, with a tender delicacy which overjoyed me. She was still with the teacher when I came back. I should have been able, he said to me, to teach her lady heraldy, geography, history, and the use of the globes, but she knows that already. She has received an excellent education. The teacher's name was Valentin de la Haye. He told me that he was an engineer and professor of mathematics. I shall have to speak of him very often in these memoirs, and my reader will make his acquaintance by his deeds better than any portrait I could give of him, so I will merely say that he was a true Tartuffe, a worthy pupil of Escobar. We had a pleasant dinner with our Hungarian friend. Henrietta was still wearing the uniform, and I longed to see her dressed as a woman. She expected a dress to be ready for the next day, and she was already supplied with petticoats and chemises. Henriette was full of wit, and a mistress of repartee. The milliner, who was a native of Lyon, came in one morning and said in French, Madame et Monsieur, j'ai la honneur de vous souhaiter le bonjour. Why, said my friend, do you not say Monsieur et Madame? I have always heard that in society the precedence is given to the ladies. But from whom do we wish to receive that honor? From gentlemen, of course. And do you not see that women would render themselves ridiculous if they do not grant to men the same that which they expect from them? If we wish them never to fail in politeness towards us, we must show them the example. Madame, answered this shrewd milliner, you have taught me an excellent lesson, and I will profit by it. Monsieur et Madame, je suis votre servante. This feminine controversy greatly amused me. Those who do not believe that a woman can make a man happy through the twenty-four hours of the day have never possessed a woman like Henrietta. The happiness which filled me, if I can express it in that manner, was much greater when I conversed with her, even than when I held her in my arms. She had read much, she had great tact, and her taste was naturally excellent. Her judgment was sane, and, without being learned, she could argue like a mathematician, easily and without pretension, and in everything she had that natural grace which is so charming. She never tried to be witty when she said something of importance, but accompanied her words with a smile which imparted to them an appearance of trifling, and brought them within the understanding of all. In that way she would give intelligence even to those who had gone, and she won every heart. Beauty without wit offers love nothing but the material enjoyment of its physical charms, whilst witty ugliness captivates by the charms of the mind, and the last fulfills all the desires of the man it has captivated. Then what was my position during all the time I possessed my beautiful and witty Henrietta, that of a man so supremely happy that I could scarcely realize my felicity? Let anyone ask a beautiful woman, without wit, whether she would be willing to exchange a small portion of her beauty for a sufficient dose of wit. If she speaks the truth, she will say, No, I am satisfied to be as I am. But why is she satisfied? Because she is not aware of her own deficiency. Let an ugly but witty woman be asked if she would change her wit against beauty, and she will not hesitate in saying no. 
Why? Because, knowing the value of her wit, she is well aware that it is sufficient by itself to make her a queen in any society. But a learned woman, a blue stocking, is not the creature to minister to a man's happiness. Positive knowledge is not a woman's province. It is antiseptic to the gentleness of her nature, to the amenity, to the sweet timidity, which are the greatest charms of the fair sex. Besides, women never carry their learning beyond certain limits, and the tittle-tattle of blue stockings can dazzle no one but fools. There has never been one great discovery due to a woman. The fair sex is deficient in that vigorous power which the body lends to the mind. But women are evidently superior to men in simple reasoning, in delicacy of feelings, and in that species of merit which appertains to the heart rather than to the mind. Hurl some idle sophism at a woman of intelligence. She will not unravel it, but she will not be deceived by it, and though she may not say so, she will let you guess that she does not accept it. A man, on the contrary, if he cannot unravel the sophism, takes it in a literal sense, and in that respect the learned woman is exactly the same as a man. What a burden a Madame Dacier must be to a man! May God save every honest man from such! When the new dress was brought, Henrietta told me that she did not want me to witness the process of her metamorphosis, and she desired me to go out for a walk until she had resumed her original form. I obeyed cheerfully, for the slightest wish of the woman we love is a law, and our very obedience increases our happiness. As I had nothing in particular to do, I went to a French bookseller, in whose shop I made the acquaintance of a witty hunchback, and I must say that a hunchback without wit is a raga avis. I have found it so in all countries. Of course it is not wit which gives the hump, for, thank God, all witty men are not humpbacked, but we may well say that as a general rule the hump gives wit, for the very small number of hunchbacks who have little or no wit only confirms the rule. The one I was alluding to just now was called Dubois Chatellerault. He was a very skillful engineer and director of the Mint of Parma for the Infante, although that prince could not boast of such an institution. I spent an hour with the witty hunchback, who showed me several of his engravings, and I returned to the hotel where I found the Hungarian waiting to see Henrietta. He did not know that she would that morning receive us in the attire of her sex. The door was thrown open, and a beautiful, charming woman met us with a courtesy full of grace, which no longer reminded us of the stiffness or of the too great freedom which belonged to the military costume. Her sudden appearance certainly astonished us, and we did not know what to say or what to do. She invited us to be seated, looked at the captain in a friendly manner, and pressed my hand with the warmest affection, but without giving way any more to that outward familiarity which a young officer can assume, but which does not suit a well-educated lady. Her noble and modest bearing soon compelled me to put myself in unison with her, and I did so without difficulty, for she was not acting a part, and the way in which she had resumed her natural character made it easy for me to follow her on that ground. I was gazing at her with admiration, and urged by a feeling which I did not take time to analyze. I took her hand to kiss it with respect, but, without giving me an opportunity of raising it to my lips, she offered me her lovely mouth. Never did a kiss taste so delicious. "'Am I not, then, always the same?' she said to me with deep feeling. "'No, heavenly creature. It is so true that you are no longer the same in my eyes that I cannot now use any familiarity towards you. You are no longer the witty, ye free, young officer who told Madame Querini about the game of Pharaoh.' and about the deposits made to your bank by the captain in so niggardly a manner that they were hardly worth mentioning. It is very true that, wearing the costume of my sex, I should never dare to utter such words. Yet, dearest friend, it does not prevent my being your Henrietta, that Henrietta who was in her life been guilty of three escapades, the last of which would have utterly ruined me if it had not been for you but which I call a delightful error, since it has been the cause of my knowing you. These words moved me so deeply that I was on the point of throwing myself at her feet, 
to entreat her to forgive me for not having shown her more respect. But Henriette, who saw the state that I was in, and who wanted to put an end to the pathetic scene, began to shake our poor captain, who sat as motionless as a statue, as if he had been petrified. He felt ashamed at having treated such a woman as an adventuress, for he knew that what he now saw was not an illusion. He kept looking at her with great confusion and bowing most respectfully, as if he wanted to atone for his past conduct towards her. As for Henrietta, she seemed to say to him, but without the shadow of a reproach, I am glad that you think me worth more than ten sequins. We sat down to dinner, and from that moment she did the honors of the table with the perfect ease of a person who was accustomed to fulfill that difficult duty. She treated me like a beloved husband, and the captain like a respected friend. The poor Hungarian begged me to tell her that if he had seen her as she was now in, Civ in Civitia Vecchia, when she had come out of the Tartan, he should never have dreamed of dispatching his kikaroni to her room. Oh, tell him that I do not doubt it, but is it not strange that a poor little female dress should command more respect than the garb of an officer? Pray, do not abuse the officer's costume, for it is to that that I am indebted for my happiness. Yes, she said with a loving smile, as I owe mine to the skibri of Cessna. We remained for a long time at the table, and our delightful conversation turned upon no other topic than our mutual felicity. If it had not been for the uneasiness of the poor captain, which at last struck us, we should never have put a stop either to the dinner or to our charming prattle. End of chapter 1